part of the presentation. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, great. And um, I guess how many people have either developed a, a silicon chiplet and delivered it in known good dye? Anybody have experience with that? Okay, I'm not getting a lot of answers there. How about receiving known good dye and integrating that into either an organic substrate or some kind of 2.5D kind of substrate? Okay, I had a couple of hands on that one. All right, well, so we think at Credo, we're qualified to we, we kind of talk about this because we're, as, as an industry, we keep going back and forth between homogeneous solutions and heterogeneous solutions. Um, and I'll talk about the benefits uh, based on where we are in process technology, you know, but, but ultimately, especially as we talk about high performance AI and machine learning, if we want to break apart the compute, the switching, the storage elements of those big chips and create more die size so they can actually have, you know, bigger switching tables, bigger routing tables, you know, bigger compute tables, you need to move the high speed IO off. And uh, over the I'd say in the last five years, we had two major developments at Credo, and they were both ended up being 3.2 terabit per second chiplets. Uh, one was based on 56 gig lanes on the what I'll call the line side or the transmit side off the big chip, and the other was 112 gig lanes. So you know, at those performance levels, most people are used to taking that die, doing some level of probe, and then putting it into a package part and doing some level of system level testing to be able to d deliver that you know, to an end customer you know, to build up a, a system. But in the, in the known good die scenario, it creates a lot of challenges with custom probe cards, with, you know, how you go about achieving 99% yield so that when you deliver a reasonably, um, you know, I'd say less complex uh, retimer, Surtees type of chip, which I'll talk about, relative to the big ASIC that could be doing AI or high performance computing or switching, there's a big cost paradigm there that you have to make sure you get not just your yields right, but then they get the integration yields right. So we want to we want to be able to talk about that. So the fact that we're actually shipping both of those, uh, they're they're on our website at Credo. So again, one. So as far as interfaces, I'll talk about three different die interfaces today. The first one, kind of as an industry we were dealing with, was a bunch of wires, which ended up folding into uh, OCP as as a standard. It's the one that's been pushed through this uh, this summit in this forum. And that's a wide parallel bus. So it requires a silicon interposer to be able to be really, really close and to be able to operate at anywhere from one and a half to three gigahertz of performance across those wide wires with a lot of redundancy built in. And then IEEE and, and OIF worked hard on, on, on the um, XSR standard, so extremely short reach. And the benefit of that, in, in, lieu, of die, in lieu of die area or beachfront, it allowed you to go you know, a couple inches, so 50 millimeters, and somewhere around eight to 10 dB, depending on how good your channel was in the package. So that allowed a lot more flexibility to use an organic packaging substrate and uh, push the chiplets out a little further. And when you take a look at what that means to the overall package or even the insertion loss as you're breaking off that big package to be able to drive long reach channels, that, that's, a, that's an attractive approach, right? And I'll, and I'll show an example of that here in a minute. So those are, the, those are the two that we built on. So our first one was a bunch of wires. I'll talk to that one when I get the slide going. Second one was XSR, again, both in production. And what the industry has been talking about, has everyone heard about UCIE? All right, so yeah, UCIE is probably one of the fastest growing consortiums that I've seen. There's a lot of MSAs I've seen that have grown fast, but as a consortium, um, you know, just because of, you know, maybe the power and influence of Intel, the fact that it's leveraging off of all the work of, of the PCIe and now using it in a different kind of form factor of interface. Um, but there's a lot of momentum. And then the, the real potential is what we, when we talk about chiplets, it's all about picajoules per bit per area. So we talk about beachfront and we talk about you know, what, what's the power distribution across that. So when I gave that bunch of wires versus XSR example, the bunch of wires is like 0.1 picojoules per bit, you know, for a, a two gigahertz interface. Um, the XSR, with all the flexibility it gave, but it, it's, a, it's a true CERTES, um, and that's one picojoules per bit, or 1.1 picojoules per bit. So there is a, there's a trade-off there, but the trade-off is you get, you, you get more flexibility on how you construct, you know, different dies together, right? And uh, so, see how we're doing, see how we're doing on, on IT. But 
so, so what, what the, I guess the cool thing about heterogeneous solutions in general is you get to, you get to break them apart. So we can use Lego analogies. Um, and it allows for different trade-offs, right? When I first started looking at these about 10 years ago, you know, some of the trade-offs could be, you know, if you're building, a, you know, again, a big switch, a big high-performance computing, a big AI die, you know, you, you get to max reticle, max reticle pretty quick, and those are expensive. Uh, expensive to yield, uh, you know, you die per wafer. So there was one element, say, if I could break off the high-speed IOs, then I could actually shrink my die size um, and, and actually get better die per wafer and better yield ratio, so you get better cost structure. But like anything, as soon as you, uh, you pull something off, they just want to fill it back up because they can have bigger routing tables, they can have bigger switch tables, bigger compute files. So, so there's a lot of trade-offs you can make once you start going heterogeneous, but what generally, I've, in, at least my experience is, as soon as you make that decision, it gives you more opportunity to, to create a better mousetrap of, of what you're trying to go achieve. Um, one of the other elements of, oh yeah? Okay, thank you. So one of the other, well, I'm on that one. So one of the other elements of, uh, so I guess my clock, is, is this real on the clock time? You guys right here, okay? Just make sure I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, is, uh, again, usually those, those big ASICs, I'll call them, those big SOCs want to go to the most advanced process node. Uh, but when you're, especially when you talk about CERTES technology, um, you know, we can, we can mature those in more mature nodes and, and prove out all the channels. So in the case where we built this, this chiplet called Blue Jay, I'll talk about it in a minute, but you know, our, our partner had to necessarily go to seven nanometer at the time to be able to do what they needed to go do for the switch ASIC. And we were in 12 nanometer very comfortably with a good power distribution. So I could operate in an N minus one technology, in some cases N minus two for my chiplet, while the, while the main ASIC had to go down and, or had the opportunity to go down and take advantage of the advanced process node where the CERTES hadn't been hardened yet. And a lot of times that high performance CERTES, whether it's now 112 going to 224, is the long pole in the tent for that ASIC to actually tape out in, 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 with confidence that you're gonna tape out a, you know, a 30 million, $50 million device and you have confidence in your IO. So it allowed for that kind of bifurcation to have confidence in the IO when they could focus on the digital hierarchy of their other architecture. All right, so that's why we thought chiplets would be cool since we've got a lot of experience and they're, they're kind of hard, but kind of fun at the same time. So my name is Jeff Twombly. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Credo. And um, so I've been, I've been with Credo for 10 years. Again, was responsible for kind of the product definition of these two. But I thought we should, we should step back is what, what's driving this demand? And I'll, again, I'll, I'll pick it up like we've got a tailwind. It, I, I, t I tend to look at you know, it's all about the hyperscale or data center. Now we can just say AI, AI, AI. But you know, whether you look at geographically where they're being built, the number of data centers being built, or you look at you know the sheer double-digit you know year-over-year -year growth, it, it just says you know not only is the the bandwidth expanding, but the the need for us to be able to deliver solutions as an ecosystem that can scale to the volume, you know, yield at the volume, scale at the volume, provide the power at the volume, right? So if we dig deeper in, and you look at the sustained growth is there, but what's driving it? You know, we all have to get our AI in, but it really is AI, machine learning, you know, a little bit of hyper, you know, like high performance computing, but really the AI element. And the key takeaway here is it's not only is the, 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 the bandwidth requirements and the compute requirements going, but the amount of data flow that has to happen is matching. You know, so now we're where server speeds and, and NIC speeds are matching the switch speeds and actually pushing the switches to go faster. So that's a, that's a paradigm shift on data mobility, so the connectivity angle, you know, matching the switching and the, and the compute requirements. So great opportunity. Um, I, I thought I'd use Dojo as an example. I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Tesla Dojo. Um, Peter Bannon presented this at the TSMC conference uh, a year ago, June. Um, and so it's a, tr a tremendous accomplishment. But what I like about it, he talked about in the, in the middle of that picture on the right, I guess left on that side, um, there's 25 max reticle chiplets, I like to call them. So they surrounded their, their big die with XSR. So that's, a, that's the technology they chose, and they chose Credo. And we partnered to develop, deliver this. But the, the cool part is that they use that because in order to create an array of 25 devices, you know, you, you, you couldn't do that with the two and a half D technology. So you needed, you know, 50 millimeter, a couple inches of reach to be able to make all your connectivity in your crossbar. 
So kind of cool. When, when, when generally I think of a chiplet, I think of like, like, a, like a chiclet, right? It's small, it's the I.O., but, but literally if, if constructed correctly at the system level, you actually, your, your big die you know, will be chiplets as well. It's a matter of how do we connect the big die together, then eventually you got to get off kind of into the superhighway world and you know, get panel to panel or box to box. So what, they, what he talked about also is they had the, you know, the 576 lanes around each one of those D1A6, but then they had the, then in order to get from this panel, high, high compute panel to another panel, then they used more of a traditional I.O. chiplet, uh, which allowed you to take the XSR and catch it and then go more with an MR, LR class technology that would get you panel to panel. So it was a good combination of you know, how somebody took a look at their system and said, here's how I'm gonna solve it. You know, bunches of wires wouldn't do it. I don't think UCIE would solve this problem just because of the scale of it. Uh, but I think UCI, when I talk about it later on, it has its place and it has really good, again, on that picojoules per bit per area uh, score, it's, it's got some exciting attributes to it. Okay, so I kind of hit this earlier, so I, I won't hit on this, was kind of talking about why chiplets, why go heterogeneous. You know, it's, a, it's just a, it's a system level decision you have to go through. You know, a lot of times if you can get homogeneous and you can get those hardened IOs and you can kind of fit that all into one nice yielding, you know, one, one chip and it, it sol solves your problems, that, that's a good solution. Other times it makes sense to break it. And again, break it could be just to get more reach. If I can push the chiplets out to the, out to the periphery of the package, then my insertion loss in the package might only be one or two dB and not five dB. And if I'm trying to do an LR channel, backplane, trying to get through some big system you know, constraint, then that gives me some margin I can build into my system. So there's a lot of different, you know, depending on who you are, where you play in the network, what you might balance. But whether it's stand mature, mature technology for the chip, for the I.O., go to advanced technology for the core, uh, they, 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 they all kind of play out. And again, I think we have three good alternatives, you know, a bunch of wires here, part of OCP, XSR, part of really OIF, and now, now we at UCIE, which is a big industry consortium that we can, we can pick on, but we have to make some decisions. Um, I presented this uh, originally at the TSMC conference, a good partner of ours, and they have just some fantastic tools that have really matured since I, I went down this path about eight years ago, but allow you to do some front end work on how you actually look at different ways of partitioning into your heterogeneous pieces. And then when you actually get to the other side, really focus in on how do you actually deliver those in an info or a COAS package. So if you're not familiar with those, just look them up at TSMC's website. And so real quick, uh, commercial on Credo, because it kind of starts to make sense as to how we think about <clears throat> the market. So literally, our, our mission is to address every connection in the hyperscale data center, period, right? And you know, if you look at just at a product level, you know, we can go up to things with, with our chiplets and our IP and our standard line card products. You know, at the big box level, you know, we have uh, uh, um, DSPs that go inside optical modules. I'll hit on that. And then we have, if you go on the, on the show floor, you're seeing a lot of purple cables out there. And that, those are our you know, active electrical cables. And they allow for, you know, switch rack and NIC to TOR connectivity inside the data center. So a good portfolio. So my uh, Don Bardison, who you'll see out in the, uh, in the uh, innovation center, he, he runs that, that group for me, he, um, he talks a lot about it's the CERTES and you know, having a purpose-built approach uh, to CERTES when you're building I.O. chiplets is important. So that's why I like this diagram. So you would just show that PAM4I and everything goes from there. So for every reach, you know, we look at it, whether it's a, an optically oriented you know, uh, environment, whether it's a, a, a pure copper going across a backplane, or if it's that XSR I just showed, those are purpose-built architectures that allow us to build out line card, optical, AEC, and the one that I'll focus in on now is really you know, driving into the, the chiplets that we built. I'm doing time. Um, yeah, sorry, but just, just one more. So in order to build that up, I talked about um, you know, this uh, N minus one approach. So we have an IP portfolio on on the left-hand side, where we pick and choose to build our products. Again, Credo builds retimers, gearboxes, DSPs, build cables. So we use that IP internally, but then I, I move it to advanced nodes for licensing so that the, the big chip guys can, well, thank you very much. Struggling. 
So, so we took you know, kind of like the bingo card on the left, and then we created our, the two chiplets that I'm going to talk to you about, the Blue Jay and the Nutcracker. Again, both production released, both shipping in high volume, and uh, we'll tell you about the nuance of that. So again, this is that 64 lane. It says 68. Those are some redundancy, but really 64 lanes of 56 gig gets you the 3.2 terabit per second performance. Um, and again, if you look at this was announced uh, uh, with the uh, the Barefoot Intel, uh, where they when they had their Torfino 2, these chiplets uh, were the ones that powered their I/O. So the decision was made, you know, prior to the Intel acquisition. Um, good partnership. Going to the, the Nutcracker, kind of same scenario, but we moved to 100 gig lanes. So it was 100 gig on the XSR side, again, extremely short reach, and then MR, MR plus on the line side to be able to push cables, push optics, and the like to build, to build the system up. So the way that kind of looks as an example is you kind of look at somebody building a, you know, you know, a, a 25.6 terabit uh, switching example. They would, they would license you know, the XSR from Credo and put that in their big die. Then we would provide the chiplet, push them all to the periphery, and it makes for a very you know, quick time to market. You know, again, because that, if, if that ASIC wanted to be in three nanometer today, we can still deliver this chiplet in 12 nanometer as, as, a, as a very you know, fine-tuned and uh, uh, product offering. So one of the things we learned, you know, when you go, you go down the path of anything, is um, things get, sorry, didn't mean to cheat you guys on the side. Um, Super challenging. You know, when we went down this path, and chiplets have been done. Um, I think Altera might have, no, no, you know, um, the Intel might have some of the best experiences that, with their AIB and EMIB technology um, on really, because that pushes out to high performance IO or modular IO. But, you know, being able to, you know, kind of probe at speed, custom probe cards, you know, how, how do you achieve, you know, your 99% DC scan? You know, how do you actually start looking at, you know, you know actual traffic functional testing? You know, at the probe level, um, super hard challenges. So we went through this with our partners, and then and we built it up so we could get to that high yielding. Uh, uh, you know, effectively, in, in, at least in this OSAT world, you're, you're, you're marking your wafer and you're just passing it along, and, and they dice up the wafer. So you got to be super accurate. Uh, it's super challenging, but what you do is you work back and forth with your partners on, on what's the most important test to run that would actually be system level tests on the on the big chip side. Uh, then the challengings are, are, are equally as hard. You know, if I, if I go back to the Dojo example, I mean, they have a, they have a 700, sorry, 576 lane max reticle ASIC that they've got to test at a known good die level before they put that in there. So it's not just that, that the I.O. level from a, from a credo perspective, like, like 3.2 terabits sounds like a lot, but you know, they've, got, they've got like four terabytes per side on that, on that chip. So you know, just a lot, of, a lot of nuance, right? I won't kill on that one. So I mentioned like this, this, the emergence of UCIE. Again, it's probably in, you know, in like 30 years, one of the fastest consortiums I've seen. We joined it, we're a contributing member. Uh, I think it's got a lot of promise, but at the same time, it's got a lot of questions, right? So very similarly to the slide I presented at the front, you know, what, are all the, what are all the benefits of going heterogeneous and kind of having your, your, your Lincoln log or your Lego kind of approach? Um, to, to building up the device. So nothing new there. Uh, I think everyone kind of gets that. But with the, the nuance of, of really, of UCIE was they, they've got a, a, a unique way of looking at two different advanced um, uh, structures that we call it. Uh, and that's for the 2.5D or 3D, you know, silicon interposer type approaches. So super tight spacing. And then they have a standard that's kind of similar to uh, an XSR approach, but it can only go, well, it's, it's spec to go 20 millimeters, not 50 millimeters. So it's got a little bit of limitation on the reach there. But the beauty is if we, if we can define those and the big chips lead the, the march. And that, that's my message to, to the industry is, you know, for, for guys like Credo to, and, and we have competitors that could do similar things, but to be able to build the, the reasonable IO chiplets in a mature technology, we can get there fast. I mean, literally I could, you know, if we, if we agreed on which one of these UCI variants that we wanted to have, it, it's not as simple as, but just take the XSR out and put the UCIE in. So we've, got the, we've already got the framework for how to build it. Now it's more of a, a layout structure and, and proof. And, and, and these 30s are 32-gig are NRZ, NRZ. They're not advanced, you know, you know 112 uh, PAM4. So, you know, when I, when, I, when I talk to partners and, and customers and competitors, 
you know, we're all in. Just like, you know, XSR is so clean since it's got, you know, it's one industry standard. We, we just rat are ratifying XSR Plus, which kind of gives you a little bit more reach to get outside the package. Great extension. Uh, but if we're going to go down this UCIE pana kind of panorama, uh, we, we have to agree you know, on, on which one of those interfaces or which two of those interfaces makes the most sense to, because um, it's, a, it's a huge financial commitment for the, the big AI chip and then for us to go, you know, trying to try to match them with something that's reasonable as an I.O. Apologize for the voice. Um, one last um, Credo commercial. It's like the chiplets are on our website. Again, they're, you know, we engage selectively just because there's a lot of support. But uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about them, you know, you know, please come on board. Like I said, we have eval boards, we have evaluation systems, test data, and the like. So with that, open for questions. And if you want questions, there's two mics on either side. I'm open. Oh. Hello, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts on chiplets versus CPO? or sorry, co-packaged optics? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, the co-packaged optics, you know, it's had a lot of promise for, I mean, in a lot of demonstration for, you know, a few years now, say five or six years. So I still think there's some work to be done there. And there's concerns just more on the thermal and, the, you know, what are we doing with the laser concentration and the failure rates. So I think, you know, some of those, quality and reliability uh, still need to be wrung out on the CPO front. But I think, I think chiplets, you know, can be part of that, like in the near package optics in a sense, or giving it as close as you can. So I think that might have some, some, some meaning, but uh, I think both of them need to be looked at in parallel. Thanks. You really can't see up here, by the way, if you, if you're, it's really blinded by the light, in case you guys have never done this, it's like crazy. Yeah, that should have used that. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Like I say, it's, um, th th I think heterogeneous and homogeneous will continue to fight each other. And, uh, but, you know, chiplets, you know, do have their place. And, uh, and, but we just have to agree on the standards. And like I say, UCI still has some, uh, you know, there's not just the uh, electrical side and the physical side, there's the protocol side. You know, the streaming versus the, you know, the, you know running like CXL on top of UCIE. So there's just, there's just a lot of fundamental decisions on what do you, where do you partition, where do you put the control logic. So there's just a lot of nuance that, you know, if we go into it eyes wide open with the right attitude and the right level of, you know, taking a capability to a possibility, it's there. It's just a matter of the, the ecosystem, you know, communicating. And that's system vendors, partners, and competitors. We all have to kind of, you know, understand that, you know, we're, we're kind of all in this together. So thank you. <laughs>